Yasu Korea, the host of the 2012 World Expo. The interview has come to this beautiful marine city to meet another exciting guest. Hello everyone, I'm Susan Lee McDonald and welcome back to the interview. I'm here at Expo 2012 Yasu Korea, ready to meet a very special guest. Come on in and join me. Dennis Hong is called the Da Vinci of Robotics. Dennis Hong is a professor at Virginia Tech, a world-renowned robotics engineer, and the first ever Korean to give a TED Talk. He was praised by media all over the world for developing a car that can be driven by drivers with impaired vision. Dr. Hong was also noted as one of the 10 young geniuses shaking up science today by popular science. And on July 10, 2011, his Charlie 2 robot brought the U.S. its first victory in the International Robo Cup, a humanoid robot soccer game. He is leading the way in building humanoid robots that can help people lead better lives. Recently, his robots were displayed at the DSME Marine Robot Pavilion at the World Expo in Yasu. The two-legged talking robot Charlie and Darwin, a robot that can pass and shoot a soccer ball, made the pavilion the most popular part of the expo. Dennis Hong, a mentor to aspiring robotics engineers and a leader of innovation and change. Join me, Susan McDonald, and hear his stories of human and humanoid success on this week's The Interview. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Susan. Yes, oh, hi. Nice to meet you. So nice to meet you, too. Yeah, welcome to the World Expo. Oh, uh, thank you so much. I am so looking forward to seeing your exhibit. And oh my gosh, this huge marine robot pavilion. This is the robotics pavilion, the famous one. Wow. I hear that people are standing in line. Like, look, already people like are just lined up. It hasn't opened yet, but uh, people <laughs> wait for three, five hours just to see our robots. Wow. And you've given me the special privilege to go see You're it. You're the only one's going to be here in the morning. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm so excited. Wow. Well, what are you going to show me today? Uh, we got a lot of things. We're going to show you the uh, United States' very first full size autonomous robot. Wow. Charlie. Okay. You know about Darwin. Yes. Darwin yes. He's hydrous. Uh, Strider, all the robots are here. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So, so when can we go in and see? Shall we? Yes, let's go. Let's go. Okay, yeah. great. Wow. So this is it. This is the robotics pavilion. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and a special invitation from you. And that's, uh, that's why it's too, uh, it's pretty empty. Normally yeah. it's packed with people, but it's too early in the morning. Fantastic. And I see someone over there. That is Charlie. You recognize him. Yes. Yeah, so Charlie is considered the United States' very first full-size human robot. And it's fully autonomous. So wow. it thinks by itself using artificial intelligence. Wow. So AI in action. Now, Absolutely. Are we looking at the next Terminator? Uh, no, we'll talk about more about no, that. Okay, but robots good. are developing <laughs> robot technology to help people. Okay. All of that is a sci-fi. Okay, so yeah. it's to yeah. save lives and help people. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's wake you up. Hey, Charlie. Oh, look at him. Oh, <laughs> that is incredible. Good. That is amazing. Is oh, up. and he's giving us a salute. Yeah, hey. Wow. Nice boy. Charlie is a fully autonomous robot. He can actually have a conversation with you. Really? Would oh. you like to talk? I would love to talk to Charlie. Charlie. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So just slowly speak into the microphone. Okay. Let's go a little bit closer to Charlie okay. so you can see him. Let's take a look. He oh, wants he's, to, yeah. he's such a cutie. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Susan. He responded. <laughs> and he even knows your name. Oh, you know We, we pre-programmed your name, oh, so you it's, did. <laughs> it's okay. not magic. So, so Charlie, you're from Virginia Tech. What are you doing here in Yosu? I have been waiting for you guys for the interview or I ran TV program. Oh. What <laughs> took you so long? My batteries are running out. <laughs> No, maybe that lasts for about 30 minutes, but I think he's been standing. Yeah, uh, you've been really for... tired. Well, so how are you feeling? I am exhausted. We get more than 10,000 visitors a day. Everyone wants to meet me. He's pretty popular. I yeah, you know, you're a pretty popular guy. Do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> A proposal from a robot. That's the I first think Charlie thing. likes you. Oh, <laughs> I love that first sight. I like you too, Charlie. Uh, so Charlie, as I mentioned, is a fully autonomous robot. So wow. actually, for the expo, for this display demonstration, yes. we're actually remote controlling because we don't want 
you know, something bad to happen. Yeah. But normally, you see that camera in the head, so yes, it looks I see. around. Yeah. Like he's it looking at us. It looks around and tries mm -hmm. to identify the environment, and it builds a world model, his understanding okay. of the world. And based on that, if you give him a task, he yes. can carry out fully autonomously. Wow. Yeah? So, so what kind of things can a robot like this do in so, real life? Yeah. So this one is for general research and education. But what we're mm -hmm. trying to really accomplish is uh, a human robot is a general robot that can be used for many things. For okay. example, uh, we robots normally say for the three Ds, yes. dull, dirty, dangerous. Things that okay. it's dull that we don't want to do, right. dangerous, or those kind of repetitive tasks that we don't want to yes. do, we give to robots. Huh. So at home, yeah. doing the dishes, doing my laundry, laundry <laughs> clean, taking cleaning out the, the trash. Floor. Yeah. Oh, wow. Those, yes, but normally these days we're focusing on one uh, um, really important task of saving people's lives. Like, I'll tell you more about the firefighting robots, oh, uh, disaster amazing. relief robots, and those kind of things. Yeah, so it's amazing the kind of things that robots can do that people may not be able to do because you know we would be in danger. So yep. this is something that you're helping to do to help save lives. Yeah, yep. that's what we're trying Fantastic. to do. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Well, Charlie, it's nice to meet you. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs>so these are some of the static displays they uh, these are just for a show okay but show some of our other robots so these are some of the early prototypes of Charlie's leg okay and I we're, see. Wow. Yeah, we're trying to implement new type of technology again you have to understand that these are research robots yes so we're trying to use different type of technology this one uses a linear actuator that moves extends and contracts just like okay. a human like, muscle like a muscle yeah. yeah amazing wow yeah and I see something that I kind of recognize from yeah yeah, 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 yeah yeah exactly the, this is these the are hydras. All, yeah hydras so hydras is actually a family of snake robots. Oh wow! So normally, uh, when you think about snake robots, snakes they sit sl on the ground. Sure. This is not a robot that sits on the ground. This is actually a robot for climbing structures. Oh wow! Yep. So it would climb what around? Yeah, something? you've probably seen some of the yes. things. So, mm -hmm. uh, so if so, every year hundreds of workers get killed uh, mm -hmm. from falling off from a construction site scaffolding. Yeah. So we want to uh, use robots to you know uh, whenever there's a dangerous uh, situation, we send in the robots. So the robot yeah. actually wraps around the structure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and converts the oscillating motion of the joint to a whole body rolling motion. So actually climbs by rolling up the pole. Wow. So this basically helps to save people's lives. Like exactly. For people who, who may not have to go up anymore, this would replace it, yeah. right? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I see something that I recognize again. Yes. Over here is... This is the famous Strider. The Strider. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so Strider stands for Self-Excited Tripedal Dynamic Experimental Robot. I but love right. these names. All of our robots have an acronym. Strider. Charlie is also <laughs> cognitive humanoid autonomous mm -hmm. robot learning intensive. All of them have uh, uh, acronyms. Uh, Strider is a three-legged robot, tripedal robot. Okay. But the interesting thing is this is uh, inspired from biology, inspired by nature, huh. from animal motion. I don't know any animal that has three legs. Though. Yeah, I, I've seen a dog with, well, that's a different story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's true. But the principles of how it walks mm -hmm. is based on human walking. Okay. So this is a good example of uh, biological inspiration. Mm -hmm. A uh, bio-inspired robot is not simply copying from nature, mm -hmm. but rather getting inspired by nature. Okay. And we study the principles of biology mm -hmm. and apply the principles to the robotics. Okay. In such case, the end product of the robot does not necessarily look like its counterpart in biology okay. because we're just using the principle. Mm -hmm. This one actually swings its body 180 degrees and using its uh, middle leg, it swings between the leg and catches a fall uh -huh. and stands up again. It converts its potential energy to kinetic energy over falling mm -hmm. and standing up again. And for the leg, it simply swings like a pendulum yes. instead of just moving like a robot, mm -hmm. robot, but it swings its leg. And the, the, me uh, the mechanics is very, very similar to how we humans walk with two legs. And then I see this little guy over here. Yes, this is retired. This is called Mars, okay. multi-appendage robotic system. It's a six-leg robot. It's a hexapod robot. Mm -hmm. We actually developed this robot together with NASA JPL. Oh, wow. You probably know JPL. They're famous for the Mars rovers. Yes. Mm -hmm. This robot, even though it has six legs, it's mm -hmm. developed for zero gravity in space applications. How is that possible? Does it make it sense? It doesn't fly away. Yeah, I mean, zero gravity walking doesn't make any sense. Yeah. What is it supposed to be outside the space station or the space shuttle okay. as we're walking outside in space okay. for autonomous inspection tasks? But the question is, how do you make it walk with there's no gravity? Yeah. How would you make it stick? Well, I was thinking maybe magnets. Magnets, fantastic idea if you have uh, ferrous material like steel, but may, most uh -huh. of the parts are aluminum, titanium, or oh. even ceramic, so it can't stick. I see. Uh, what about suction cups? Um, 
would it even have the no, air to do that? There's no air, so it won't yeah. work. So what we're trying to do is we're using artificial gecko feet. You know, geckos, they oh, stick. Yeah. So that's another, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, another good example of bio-inspired robotics. Interesting. Yeah, we're working with other researchers who are working on us. Uh, not sticky feet, but these mm -hmm. are gecko feet. There's a whole interesting science behind that. That's incredible. Yeah, but using those uh, for robotics applications. You know, Dennis, it's amazing to see all these different types of robots. And I know everyone is here also to see not only Charlie, oh, but... The, yeah. Darwin, Darwin, yeah, yes. everybody loves Darwin. Yeah, soccer. Yeah, it's so adorable. <laughs> but Darwin is not a toy. It's a very serious research tool. Yeah. Want to take a look at Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Shall Let's we? Go. Let's go, mm -hmm. yeah. Where are we going so, now? This is the soccer field for Darwin OPs. <gasps> Aren't they cute? <laughs> oh my gosh, they're so adorable. Look so, at them. Yeah, Darwin robots are for general research and education. Okay. So we have six robots, six okay. against six. Uh, and then as you'll see, they have a camera on the head. So they look around and try I to see. understand the environment. They look at the white lines and try to figure out where himself or herself is in the soccer field. We call that localization. Gotcha. It uses also color to help them so they can identify the ball, huh. other opponents, uh, teams of robots uh, motion. The gold one is yellow and blue. Okay. And they understand the game of soccer, the rules. So they try to do cooperative uh, team play as well. That is so adorable. Yeah. Oh so my they're gosh. looking around, trying to find their starting position. They're just looking around. Yeah. Wow. So they have a personality. Look at their you know, faces. They're looking around, figure out, oh, where am I? Where's the goal? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be here, and those kind of things. And so they know that they're here to play soccer. Yep, that's, right? that's their job. See, that so they found the ball, yep. and he's going to make a kick. Then <laughs> oh, oh, almost, almost. Almost there. Oh. 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 He kicked it, yep. and it actually went over there. Yep. So. And now these other guys, now they're all looking for the ball, right? Not only that, but they also communicate using Wi-Fi. So one interesting oh. thing is, let's say a robot doesn't know, cannot see where the ball is, mm -hmm. the other team can share that information. Oh! <laughs> they fall down a lot too, right? But you know, they, it's amazing how they know how to get back up. Mm -hmm. It's like little kids, like maybe three, four-year-old kids. Oh, you're going to fall down! Oh, Team, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you have to understand that this is very sophisticated technology. It's yeah. not just fun and games. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not doing this just for the fun. This is really a research, like a very difficult, uh, challenging research task. So what can Darwin do? Yeah. So this is just a demonstration of mm -hmm. some of the technology. Mm -hmm. And actually, this robot soccer is a fantastic way to do benchmarking. The competition teams from all around the world, from all the different robotics labs. Oh, 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 oh. And ah, oh, come Almost. to this competition and demonstrate their technology, mm -hmm. exchange information. So it's a f fantastic uh, ways of doing benchmarking. Okay. But Darn is a general research and education robot. Uh, currently, about 400 units are being used worldwide. We announced it only about a year ago. Really? Yeah. And, and it's so popular. How much would something like this cost? Uh, so cost. Interesting thing is, it is a product that you can buy, but that's really? not the point. The interesting thing is, it's a fully open source project, which means that gotcha. all the hardware, software, everything is online for free. So, so people, if I wanted to make Darwin, yes. and I had the tools and the kind of smart All the instructions, what to buy, how to fabricate them, wow. how to assemble them, all the software, everything is online for free. Incredible. I'm not making a dime out of it, so <laughs> if I were smart, probably I should, you know. But anyway, <laughs> that's not the point. The whole idea is by opening it up, mm -hmm. uh, everybody can benefit from it. Yes. I truly believe that's the quickest way to develop robotics technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, to keep that technology just to yourself would limit you know, other ideas from coming in, mm -hmm. right? So this is a, a very ingenious way of doing things. Ah, oh, he kicked it, there you go. he kicked it out. <laughs> oh. Dennis, I can see why you absolutely love your job. That was so much fun being there. <laughs> My, my job is actually not a job, it's actually my hobby. Mm -hmm. I'll do the exact same thing even though I don't get paid, but probably shouldn't say that in front of the cameras. <laughs> but yeah, it's my hobby. It's so much fun. You know, I'm so amazed that uh, someone like yourself who's you know, followed your passion uh -huh. has created such an incredible series of robots. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me like, a little bit more about just the inspiration that you have for doing what you do? Mm, okay, so maybe I think it's a, a we should start by when I, how I got into robotics. So when I was a kid, when I was seven years old, mm -hmm. by the way, I was born in the States. Okay. And all of my family moved to uh, Korea when I was three years old. And I grew up in Korea. And why did you guys move back to Korea? Uh, my dad is a, a scientist and engineer in mm -hmm. the aerospace. During the Park Chung-hee, uh, President Park Chung-hee, yes. uh, uh, 
era, there were some special uh, military-related uh, projects, and the president wanted my dad to head oh, wow. the project, so we had to move to Korea. Okay. Uh, but uh, so actually, when I was living living in Korea, I was in a foreigner status. I so see. at the time, the Hewei uh, Oing uh, Chairo was not there, so. Mm -hmm. uh, the, Normally, Korean people couldn't really travel freely to uh, overseas, but yes. I could. So we travel a lot, and my mom and dad really encouraged uh, us traveling because travel is not just for entertainment; it's mm -hmm. as uh, living education. They always mm -hmm. told me. But anyway, so when I was seven years old, I watched a movie, Star Wars, the first one, oh, Episode Four. Oh, I love four. that yep. movie, Star Wars. It actually just completely blew my mind with wow. all the flying spaceships and the robots. Mm -hmm. But I was really, really fascinated by the two famous robots, R two D two and C three PO. Well, I was naked for long. Anyway, I was just fascinated. So that very day, on my way back to my home, yes. to the hotel, mm -hmm. in the car, I decided to become a robot scientist. Wow. And I never changed my mind, and I'm here Who today. Who knew that George Lucas's uh, dream and <laughs> that Star Wars would become your life? It's my life, it's wow. my passion, and I'm living it. <laughs> That's incredible. So if you hadn't seen Star Wars, where do you think you'd be right now? So. I do tell people, which is true, that I decided to become a robot scientist when I was seven years old. And mm -hmm. I never changed my mind. That is true. However, besides robotics, mm -hmm. I also had other dreams as well. Mm. So one is I wanted to become a professional magician. Another yes, I hear one. Here you're a semi-professional ma magician. Yes, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. <laughs> the second one is I wanted to become a chef, a chef. Uh, owner of a restaurant, a chef. Uh -huh. And the third is a, a th uh, amusement park ride designer. Okay. And of course a robot. So I had four dreams. Wow. But the interesting thing is you really never know among your dreams what is going to be your mm -hmm. occupation, your job. Mm -hmm. So I follow all four of my dreams. Currently, I'm huh. living that dream of, be of being a roboticist. Okay. But I had never gave up the f other three as well. So you still cook? I still cook. So at my home, I'm the chef. I cook every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I have time, I go to the farmer's market and yeah. buy whatever's fresh. Mm -hmm. And I like improvising at home, mm -hmm. cooking fantastic meals. I bring uh, friends and family over. I have like six, seven course degustation menus. Wow. If you go to my website, you can see the, the menus as well. Well, you so, know, I'm from Virginia. So next time I'm in Virginia, are you going to invite over. me over? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll see how good your food yep. is. <laughs> so um, so that's a, it's a serious hobby. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you never know if I retire, I might open my own restaurant. So I have never given up my dream. The second dream of mm -hmm. being a magician, so I started uh, magic when I was a small kid, when mm -hmm. I was in elementary school. I lived in Korea. Yep. So at that time, magic was relatively new yeah. to Korea. So my dad bought me those, you know, those toy magic kit kind of things. Yes. And, you know, the, the teasing kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I showed it to my friends, and everyone was like, oh, this is absolutely amazing. So after you that. You like the star of your friends. Yeah, yeah. So my dad bought me more stuff. And I become really serious. So I start studying the, the, the theory of magic, theory of magic, uh -huh. close up magic, and stage, uh, stage magic as well. So like David Copperfield, Houdini. And yeah, those kind of yeah. things, not to that not scale, to that level, but, but I was a small kid and my sister together, we did mm -hmm. magic and uh, two cute kids doing mag magic stuff. So we, we get, became popular. We're on mm -hmm. TV twice. Oh, wow. uh, we've been on stages. We go to uh, 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 the uh, houses for old people's house mm -hmm. and the orphanages and we do those kind of uh, magic shows for people. Oh, how sweet. Uh, so it was fun. Now, of course, when I was a kid, everything worked out. But mm -hmm. now I became now as a professor, I can't really do a magic show. Yeah. So these days, I do a uh, two-hour lecture on the science and psychology behind magic. Interesting. Yeah, but actually, it's really a magic show in disguise as a lecture. Yeah. <laughs> but we do that, and we actually sell tickets as for uh, um, uh, charity events. Okay. Uh, and in a few hours, all the tickets are sold out. It's very wow. popular. Yeah. So magician. A chef. Oh, mm -hmm. the third one, a theme park, uh, amusement park designer. So I haven't okay. given up that dream. Okay. And as a matter of fact, in Korea, there's uh, there's a big project called the Masan Robot Land. Yes. They're building a huge amusement park mm -hmm. uh, f uh, with a theme of robotics. Mm -hmm. I'm a big part of that, so I'm still living all four of my dreams. That's incredible, Dennis. You know, you said that you're a, a magician, but mm -hmm. and surely in the eyes of many people with your robotics work, you are a magician. I mean, that's that's kind of a loose interpretation, but <laughs> kids look up to you like crazy here. And every child's dream is to talk to someone who makes robots and to talk to the robots themselves like I just did earlier today. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that? Uh, so, so something weird happened about like two years ago. So my work has been very, very well uh, known and well received mm -hmm. in the academic and the robotics community. But I think about two years ago, there were some, uh, you know, our robots became famous in covers of magazines mm -hmm. and TV programs. And after that TED conference talk, yes. uh, my popularity just grew, like exploded. Yeah. And I become 
uh, I don't know, uh, famous, uh, you for, have the, famous. <laughs> for the general public, yeah. especially in Korea. Mm -hmm. So these days I walk in Myeongdo and people recognize me. Yeah. They ask for autographs mm -hmm. and the people want to take a picture of me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of, uh, 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 what should I say, weird, odd, but yeah. at the same time it makes you feel good at the same time. But uh, uh, I'm always on my, my feet, put my feet on the ground and trying to shrink my head as well. Dennis, it sounds like you are the multitasking magician. How do you get all of this done in, in one day? Tell me your like morning to night schedule. Okay. So there's only 24 hours a day yeah. and there's too much stuff to do. Mm -hmm. So the only part that I cut is sleep. So okay. actually I sleep only four hours at night. What? Four hours four a night? Four hours at night. But I, so I'll probably tell you the story. So at 5 to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. I go home and I cook every day. So I'm, I cook dinner, mm -hmm. have good quality time uh, at home mm -hmm. and we go to bed. And then once my wow. wife, you know, Falls to sleep, I sneak out and I go back to my lab. <laughs> uh, my students are only there, so we work and do research and things. Okay. About like 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock a.m., okay. I come back, I sleep, and we wake up together in the morning. Oh my goodness. And then I come back to the lab. Now my oh, she wife. She knows. That she you knows. Okay. I, I'm not sneaking out, okay. actually. Right. I got up uh, so off show like, No, no, it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, she doesn't matter. It's okay because she's asleep anyway. So okay. uh, she said it was okay, so I got off show permission. Okay. But after lunch, I do have to take a 10 to 15 minute nap. If oh. I don't get that nap, then I'm a zombie for the entire afternoon. I see. But the interesting thing is that nap time, so after lunch, I come mm -hmm. to my, I lock the door, and I have this recliner, right? and then I instantly <laughs> fall asleep. And after 10 to 15 minutes, mm -hmm. I don't even need an alarm clock. I just pop up, wake up, and I'm ready to go. I'm fully oh, wow. uh, energy, you know, recharged, and I can do that. That's incredible. Yeah, so that's what I do. You know. What's really amazing to me is that someone like you yourself, who has so much passion for what he does, um, is actually living the dream. I am living my dream, yes. I mean, what do you say to that? Like, do you wake up in the morning after four hours of sleep saying, uh -huh. thank you, God, that I can only do what, you know, only people dream of. I challenge you to try to find me when I'm not smiling. I'm <laughs> smiling 24 hours yeah. a day. Probably I'm smiling even when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I don't, it's just, it's fun, it's rewarding. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about what I do. Uh, you know, just being on, I live on campus because I'm a professor. Mm -hmm. Just the, the sheer energy of the students, mm -hmm. the sparkling eyes. I'm blessed of working and living in an environment just filled with energy, young energy and mm -hmm. passion and the brightest minds working together. It's, it's great. Now, you are a professor at Virginia Tech. Yes. So let's walk through your, your, your childhood and your academic background and how you got to Virginia Tech okay. before we go on to some other stuff. Uh -huh. so, so tell me about uh, school. So you were born here, mm -hmm. you went to Korea, mm -hmm. you went to all of your elementary, junior high, high school, yeah. and beginning of college in yeah. Korea, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so uh, I went to Gyeonggi Yuchuan, okay. Banpo Chodongakyo, mm -hmm. Bangbe uh, Chungakyo, Seoulgunakyo, and I went to Korea okay. uh, Korea University. But okay. after my second year, I transferred to University of Wisconsin Madison. So oh. I came back to the States. So why did you transfer at that time? Uh, so for many reasons, but mainly my dad told me. So I was planning to c come back to the States for my graduate school. I but see. Uh, it might be we all thought that I thought that it might be good to go there early to prepare early, uh -huh. and I was trying to like uh, you know considering and thinking. And my dad one day told me. Uh, Okay. A big fish you must swim in the big sea. Yes. Uh, sea. Mm -hmm. So they said, you know, go ahead. So that's wow. why I uh, went back. And then for my master's and PhD, I went to Purdue University. Yes. Um, to become a professor, normally you have to do a postdoc. You need uh, mm -hmm. additional academic or training. Yes. But right after I finished my PhD, I was directly recruited at uh, Virginia Tech. Now, and why did they recruit you right out of uh, Purdue? They were, they were smart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, Obviously. <laughs> Uh, Look at the press that you're bringing. Uh, I, I think they saw the potential in mm -hmm. me. Um, my my research, my my PhD work dissertation was all good, but mm -hmm. I think uh, during the phone interview, I really showed passion and I really was able to show what I my what my dream was, and I think that actually you know mm -hmm. uh, went through, and they actually you know I convinced them. Yes. So now of those. Uh, awesome schools mm -hmm. that do robotics. Mm -hmm. um, what differentiates your program at Virginia Tech? Okay, so many things. Uh, but the, probably the most important thing that stands out is there are f absolutely great 
labs in the world in robotics that mm -hmm. do fantastic work. Mm -hmm. But they usually focus on one thing. They're an expert in robot vision, expert mm -hmm. in uh, dynamics and control. Mm -hmm. they're, they're expert in specific areas in robotics. Mm -hmm. Our lab builds the entire system. We build the entire robot. Okay. Charlie, yes. entire thing. Darwin, Strider, all those kind of things. So it's not just one part, it's the entire machine. Entire thing. Okay. So also we do build hardware. A lot mm -hmm. of work, uh, labs do fantastic work, but they only do simulation or theoretical mm -hmm. work, published paper. In my experience as a graduate student, mm -hmm. you study these fantastic journal papers mm -hmm. and you try to implement it in real hardware mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. Uh -huh. because, not because they were wrong, but because they make these certain assumptions which is not based on real reality. Okay. So until, for, especially for robotics, unless you really implement and try it, you really mm -hmm. don't know mm -hmm. the true impact of the work. Yep. So in an early stage, I believe that, oh, building on hardware mm -hmm. is very important for it. So we build robots not because it's just exciting and fun. It yeah. is fun and exciting, yeah. but really build it to validate our research work. I see. So our so lab is- So it's like from start to finish, you get to see the entire process. Exactly. Right. So that's, we are very well known for building robots. Mm -hmm. Now, so that's another special skill set that mm -hmm. we have. It's our expertise. Uh, robotics is a very wide field. Mm -hmm. From one end of the spectrum, more the mechanical work of design, kinematics, and those kind of mm -hmm. things. The other end of the spectrum, more of the computer science of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and everything between mechatronics, sensors, wow. electronics, everything. So unless you know everything, you cannot build the entire system. Yes. But obviously, you cannot be an expert on all the things. Yep. Thus, collaboration is important. Uh -huh. So personally, my real background is in mechanical engineering, okay. kinematics, and those kind of things. But I have enough uh, uh, knowledge of uh, all the aspects. I'm not an expert on mm -hmm. all the things, but I know enough. So I can. So you're a generalist in these other areas, yes. and you bring in the experts. And yes, the I collaborate, and mm -hmm. I'm a fantastic system integrator because mm -hmm. I know what works, what doesn't work, yes. how they work together. So I'm an expert on that. That's fantastic. So I work with uh, other professors in different mm -hmm. areas, uh, and we build the entire system. Mm -hmm. But I have to, you know, make it clear that. Building the robot is not the end goal, even huh. though people just see the robot. The really? fun, yeah, okay. you see Charlie moving. That's not really the end goal. Really? Those then robots what is? are the robots are just to test and validate our research work. I see. So our job is to really generate new knowledge that mm -hmm. people can use, other research can use, and base their research uh, based on that. So that's what we're trying to do. But also more important than that, do you know the real product of our lab is? Tell it's me. not the robots, it's not the robotics technology, it's not the publications. Okay. My belief is that our product is mm -hmm. our students. Uh -huh. we're, we're producing the top brilliant minds in robotics mm -hmm. that they're going to carry our mission and they're going to do the great job. You've been talking about some of the technology that your um, robotics has really done, and I want to go through some of those really important things sure, that you've done. Sure, sure. Uh, tell us about Impasse. Oh, Impasse. So, Impasse is a robot. It's a unique locomotion mobility mm -hmm. robot. So, it's the best of both worlds of wheels and legs. Okay. So, it's a wheel leg hybrid robot. All right. So, think of a rimless wheel. So, the rim is not there, it's just mm -hmm. a spoke wheel mm -hmm. of the wheel, but the spokes move in and out of the hub. Mm -hmm. So, it can roll like a wheel if you yes. want to or move the spokes in and out and use them as legs. Okay. So it can go over very, very rough terrain, it can wow. climb very, very big obstacles. Mm -hmm. And the main application area, so it's really to, if you want to want your machine or robot to mm -hmm. get someplace that a wheel cannot go, okay. that's where you use For example, like where could a wheel not go? Sure, uh, uh, disaster relief, okay. uh, building collapses, need to go over this kind of thing. I see. So there's an earthquake, a building collapses, mm -hmm. and people can't go in there, but you can send in an impasse yes. robot to yes. go in and... Or scientific exploration uh -huh. in Mars, there's certain areas that robots cannot, regular wheels cannot access, mm -hmm. access, have access to. That's where you use these type of new type of okay. mobility system. Okay. So that's impasse. By the way, the name is kind of a, impasse means that you cannot pass, yes. but you know, it can pass any <laughs> environment. So <laughs> You've also got Climber. Climber, Tell yes. Tell us about Climber. Climber uh, is a climbing robot. Well, all of the names are acronyms. IMPAS yes. stands for Intelligent Mobility Platform Actuary Spoke System. Climber is Cable Suspended. Uh, climb limbed in uh, limbs of a robot, something like that, but <laughs> it's been a while. So this is a robot that can climb cliffs autonomously. That's incredible. Yeah, so this one actually came from, so I was at a NASA JPL, the mm -hmm. Jet Proportional Laboratory, yes. about six years ago. I okay. worked there for the summer. Uh, I had a lot of chance to talk to not just the uh, robotic scientists, but the geologists. Mm -hmm. So these are the scientists who 
study the Mars soil and try to figure mm -hmm. out, the, try to answer the questions, uh, the fundamental scientific questions. And they've been, been uh, telling me that the, the NASA JPL rovers, the Mars rovers, which are still there, yeah. are fantastic. But the problem is they cannot get to the cliffs. And the cliff is where that's the really science rich site. Yes. They want to get to the cliff. Right, there's the geological exactly, history. Exactly, the history, right? yeah. But the, the robots cannot get there. Yeah. So, uh, inspired by that, I want to build a robot mm -hmm. that can climb the cliff for scientific research okay. and, of course, for uh, you know, search and rescue missions as well. How viable is that right now? Is it in the works? Is it yeah, actually we, being actually? It's, it's a long, it's, a, it's an old project. Some of our undergraduate students uh, worked on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we had a first part that worked, but we didn't get funding for that. So, it's currently on the shelf. We have a lot That's of projects bad. that uh, we started has potential, but still on the shelf because we're working on so many other exciting and important projects. Yes. One day I would like to resurrect it, though. There's a very f amazing uh, project that I know that you were involved with, mm -hmm. and that is the car that is uh, drivable by the blind, oh, yes. by the visually impaired. Tell us about that. Oh, that's, that's a very different type of project. Actually, it's dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. On January 29th, 2011, the whole world watched as Professor Dennis Hong revealed the first car for blind drivers. The test driver was Mark Riccobono, an executive with the National Federation of the Blind. He made it through the various obstacles being thrown in his way, as if he could see in front of him. He even passed a van driving alongside him to successfully drive around a 2.4 kilometer track, amazing everyone in the stands. Dennis Hong opened up the possibility of autonomous driving for the blind. Well, How was this possible? Right the, hotel, right? <laughs> the centerpiece of his automobile technology is a non-visual user interface. A drive grip sends vibrations to the knuckles to indicate the movement of the handle. A vibrating motor in the seat called a speed strip adjusts direction and speed. But the highlight is the AirPix, a tablet with many holes that uses compressed air to create an image on the user's hand placed over it. With this project, Dennis Hong broke all preconceptions about the limitations of visual impairment. We all together, we made it happen. Again, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. The technology used for the automobile interface can be applied in various ways to the everyday life of people with visual impairments. Dennis Hong's creativity and passion is fueled by challenges and obstacles. His relentless efforts to make robots that will help humankind are bringing change to the global society every day. The world is watching to see what he will come up with next. From your, from your lab at Virginia Tech, uh, and which you uh, call it the Romela. Romela, right? it rolls off your tongue, Romela. Romela, what does that stand for? Robotics and Mechanisms Laboratory. Okay. Robotics, it's because of robotics. Mechanisms, because my real background is in the mechanical side mm -hmm. of it. So initially, we want to focus that, oh, we do robotics, but more on the mechanisms, the mechanical okay. side of it, and laboratory. But as I mentioned, now we cover the entire spectrum of robots, and we do develop the entire system. So. So at Romella, yes. is that how you say it yeah, when you're Romella. at yeah, so at Romella, yeah. you have uh, all these different projects going on and also you mentioned earlier the DARPA challenge. Oh now, yeah. You've been involved <laughs> in the DARPA challenge yes. which has those crazy robots that go across the country mm -hmm, and across mm -hmm. the deserts. Um, tell me your involvement in that and what new projects you have coming Sure. Out. So the DARPA challenge, in case you haven't heard, the DARPA is the, the research wing of the, the United States uh, Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. So it's more of most. So the internet was born from the DARPA project. Mm -hmm. DARPA projects are normally the craziest, wackiest, out of this world, science fiction type of big budget projects. Mm -hmm. So this was in 2007. So the, the DARPA Urban Challenge was in 2007. Mm -hmm. Before that, we had the two DARPA Grand Challenges. Mm -hmm. So this is a series of uh, competitions about developing a fully autonomous car, it's a robotics car. Mm -hmm. So you press start, nobody touches anything, and the car needs to reach its destination mm -hmm. without any human intervention. Okay. It needs to follow the rules of the road, mm -hmm. uh, traffic, uh, you know, uh, traffic uh, uh, intersections, yes. rotaries, mm -hmm. park itself, and everything like that. Wow. So Virginia Tech participated. So that's about when I first joined Virginia Tech. So okay. I was not a part of the first two grand challenges, I see. but I was a co-team leader for the DARPA Urban Challenge, which okay. was the last of the three series. And that was series. in what year? That was in 2007. Okay, yeah. So we developed this car. 
it was fantastic. So uh, maybe, I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk, tell you about the story. So we had 46 undergraduate students and six graduate students and okay. three faculty working on this wow. project. But all my colleagues and friends in different, uh, on different teams from other universities, uh, they said they like, yeah, but then it's, if you really want to take, win, if you're serious, you cannot do this with undergraduates because it's really, it's a very, very challenging mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. At the time, people thought it was impossible, it was mm -hmm. that, that difficult. Yes. But I really wanted to show the world that with the right resources, mm -hmm. guidance, and the support, mm -hmm. undergraduate students can achieve great things. Wow. I've experienced that, I've demonstrated many, many times for mm -hmm. our other projects as well. So we had 40 something undergraduate students working on the team. And of course wow. we showed them. Uh, everybody remembers the first place and the second place, Carnegie Mellon Redwood Curse mm -hmm. team and Sebastian from Stanford. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people remember that we were the third place winners and That's we won half a million dollars. That's an incredible honor. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we uh, showed the world that with the you know undergrad students can do fantastic work. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of them. That's amazing. What is your other project now that you're preparing for with the DARPA challenge? Okay, so... Is this an exclusive? Uh, yes, so I haven't talked to... Uh, this is the first time I'm mentioning officially. Okay. It's called the DARPA Robotics Challenge. You remember uh, not too long with the, in Japan, the Fukushima Taichi uh, the, disaster. The, yes. Yeah, uh, nuclear plant disaster. Mm -hmm. Very, very sad. Mm -hmm. But when that happened, uh, Japan, probably most people think Japan is the number one country in robotics in the world. Mm -hmm. So people had this high hopes. Oh. The Honda Asimo, the human robot, all mm -hmm. these great robots that they've been demonstrating, mm -hmm. they're going to send it in and rescue people and, mm -hmm. you know, do the disaster relief. And mm -hmm. the, the Japanese people were like, oh, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And at the end, they were not able to send a single robot. Huh. Well, some test robots, yes. yes. And they actually used some of the U.S. robots from, uh, called PACPA from iRobot okay. and to do those kind of things. And it was a really shame to the country. That's too bad. Yeah. Uh, so DARPA inspired by that said, mm -hmm. oh, this is a very, very important mission. Mm -hmm. We are developing a lot of robots, but if you can't really use it for real disasters, mm -hmm. what use is this for? So they announced this new challenge called the DARPA Rolex Challenge. Okay. Now. The DARPA Rolex Challenge? Uh, robotics, robotics Challenge. Robotics Challenge. Robotics okay. Challenge. The robot needs to get into a car, a car, okay. a regular car. All right. Needs to drive the car to a mock disaster site. All right. It needs to get out of the car. Uh -huh. is to walk on a debris field and clear the debris and obstacles. Uh -huh. It needs to open a door, walk in this disaster site. There's going to be a you know, series of system of pipes. It needs to look around and find a leaking pipe. It needs to close the valve of the pipe. It needs to replace a mortar. Wow. Not done yet. It needs to climb up a ladder, go on a catwalk. At the end, there's going to be a concrete wall. And it used to use these like the tools to punch a hole out of the, the wall and punch through and go through the wall. Whoa. That is the competition. And it's going to happen December 2013. The second one is going to be in December 2014. Wow. So you've got about a year and a half and to prepare. And not only that, but this is, so there's a word called DARPA hard. It means that it's ridiculously, instantly difficult. But DARPA yet, hard? Yeah, yet <laughs> not impossible. Okay. Right? You think it's impossible, it's not really impossible. Wow. We call this DARPA hard. So when you go to conference, I talk to different robotics and I have mm -hmm. a lot of friends and we talk about this. Oh, this is a really exciting project coming up, yeah. but this is beyond DARPA hard. Wow. <laughs> and DARPA is going to select only five teams from the entire world. So teams have been, you know, submitting mm -hmm. proposals. And after DARPA said that this is the the biggest scale, the highest budget uh, Dar DARPA ever funded in a robotics program. Wow. So this is the, in the history of robotics is the biggest project. Did you get to be one of the five? I'm not going to mention on camera, but you will hear very, very uh, good, exciting yes. news, and you'll see things. With all this exciting stuff, with the uh, visually impaired being able to drive a car, and the DARPA Urban Challenge, and the new project that's coming up, you've got so many things uh -huh. that uh, you've, you've done and you can do. We, we forgot to mention the amazing project, the Sapphire project. Yeah, yeah, Sapphire. And I'd, and I'd love to hear more about sure. that. Sure. So Sapphire project is for the U.S. Navy. Mm -hmm. Sapphire, again, stands for Shipboard Autonomous Fire Fighting Robot. Okay. So the Navy wants to have a robot that can fight fires on ships. Wow. So initially, I wrote a proposal to the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, the Office of Naval Research, or mm -hmm. ONR. And the proposal was a robot firefighting hose. Mm -hmm. So the hose itself is a robot. It's a snake robot. Okay. So similar to the fire. So is it similar to the Hydra? Hydra, yes. Okay. And then to the fire, and then props like a cobra and shoots water or water form <laughs> to fight fires. Isn't that brilliant? Wow, that's And awesome. they really, really liked the idea and mm -hmm. they were about to fund us. But at the time, we made a lot of success with mm -hmm. 
Charlie and Darwin, and mm -hmm. we start to get more interested in humanoid robots. Mm -hmm. So we went back to, to the Navy and bravely said, well, yeah, the snake robot is a good idea, but would you be interested in a humanoid robot instead? Huh. And they were like skeptical. Hmm, yeah, but why humanoid robot? Mm -hmm. So there's a good reason why we want to use humanoid robots okay. for fighting fires on the ships. Okay. Now, one thing is that the ship mm -hmm. is designed by humans for humans. Yes. There's a reason why the stairs are this high. There's a mm -hmm. reason why your door handle is this high. Mm -hmm. So it's, since it's an environment designed for humans to walk mm -hmm. around, I claim that unless the robot is of the human size and form, it won't be able to to get maneuver around. within the ship. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, if you've been to a Navy ship, mm -hmm. if you open these door hatches, yes. the door seal is really, really high up to the knee. You call it yeah. knee knockers. Mm -hmm. Wheels or treads cannot go. Right. But humans can, thus, they a can human can. Over can. It. Yeah, so that's okay. one good reason. Another thing is a ship, so it has C state to move up and yes. down the seat. So, if you have legs, you can balance, balance yourself, uh -huh. right? Another important thing is it's a firefighting robot, so okay. the robot needs to be protected against the flame and heat. Mm. If you have wheels or tank treads, mm -hmm. you cannot cover them because ah. they need to be exposed and rotating continuously. Yes. Right? If you cover up the wheels, how can you go? Right. Humans can withstand the heat by putting on a firefighter suit. Okay. So, so you'll have a robot with a suit? Absolutely. Okay. If a human can withstand the heat with putting on a suit, if you have a human robot, put in a firefighting suit. Uh -huh. Isn't that brilliant? Of nice. course, there's other problems with overheating <laughs> and those kind of things, but that's the whole idea. Okay. And ultimately, the thing is, if this robot is successful in fighting fires, mm -hmm. then it will have, in the future, have a very high impact. So the robot is a humanoid form, it's a humanoid robot, so it can do mm -hmm. all the things that humans do. Mm -hmm. Mopping the deck, cooking the food, delivering okay. the food, you know, making up your bed, all those kind of things. So huh. we're looking in the future to try to have the Swiss Army knife of robots. Wonderful. So, so that's Project yeah. Sapphire. What do you think is, is going to be the next step in your helping more people? Yeah, so as I mentioned, most of our robotics project has a common theme mm -hmm. of helping people, helping mm -hmm. the society. Uh, one project that we have not announced yet is, the, you, we talked about the blind driver challenge, yes. Car for the Blind. So that project is done. And okay. after that, it could be commercialized. Mm -hmm. Other labs could you know, further develop on that. Mm -hmm. But we still want to continue developing technology mm -hmm. for the blind. So one project that we're currently working on, st working on to start soon is the blind uh, indoor navigation challenge. Indoor navigation. Indoor. So you know those GPS, the navigation things? Yes. They use GPS, which uses the satellite. Huh. So GPS only works outdoors. It, cannot, it does not work indoors. Yes. So we're cr trying to use robotics technology. There's a technique called SLAM, mm -hmm. Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. It's a okay. technology used for indoor robots to navigate. Mm -hmm. So hey, why not use that technology and develop devices huh. to help the blind to navigate indoors? Right. So think about it, a blind yeah. person using this device Wow. can go into a grocery store on their own, independently, wow. freedom, and find the things that they want to buy. So, I mean, it's, it's not acting instead of a, a guide dog, like a seeing eye dog. Mm -hmm. It actually helps maybe to pick out items that they might actually But need. that's the plan, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, and I mean, how realistic do you think that is, uh, and how soon do you think uh, that The technology is there yeah. for robots. We mm -hmm. just need to translate that to use for, wow. for use for people. Incredible. Yeah. Hmm, what would, I, what would I say to myself if I can go back and meet my, like in a time machine? Uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, when you grow up you, as an adult, you look back and sometimes you have regrets. Maybe I should do this, I should have done that. Uh, of course, I have those kind of things, small incidents, but in the majority, I think I did pretty well. Uh, I think my, I really thank my parents. They guide me in the right direction. They give us the freedom to explore what we want to do. So I really uh, appreciate those kind of things. Uh, but you know, if I had to, if I could go back and restart my life again, I'd probably take the same path. I'm I'm very very happy where I am, and I'm very excited where I'm going to. Dennis, one of the things that I think is uh, pretty amazing about the work that you do is that it's not just your passion, mm -hmm. right? You have to have the smarts behind it. Mm -hmm. Can you give us uh, your personal philosophy about how to be successful in whatever you do? Sure. So um, there's many things. Mm -hmm. What I want to tell the students is that just because you have passion and creativity, mm -hmm. you can to really reach. You, you only can do so much, mm -hmm. right? To really. Uh, attack and the, the, the solve the grand challenges of robotics. You mm -hmm. have to go beyond the hobbyist robotics. Okay. And to do that, 
you need to have the tools. Okay. So I, I talked about this in one of my uh, very well received TED Talks. Mm -hmm. So I always compare to Batman. So Batman uh -huh. fighting against the bad guys. You know yeah. this utility belt? Yes. They have the grappling hook and the mm -hmm. flash, all this yep. gadgets yep. kind of things. So the more tools Batman has, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the more effective he can be against yes. fighting with the bad guys. Mm -hmm. For us roboticists, we also need to have this tool belt. Right. Those tools are the courses, classes you take in school. And doing well in them. And doing well in them. Yeah. Linear algebra, I got differential equations, all these things. So mm -hmm. the more classes, courses you take and do well, mm -hmm. and you're good at using the tool, mm -hmm. the more effective you can attack the big grand challenge of robotics. So yeah. school is important, mm -hmm. you know, so stay in school. You know, you're often quoted as saying that the fundamentals are very, very important and your students should be really diligent in their studies. Um, what do you think are the, the fundamentals for any student who wants to get into robotics? Uh, of course, passion. You really need to do, you need to really love and l love the thing that you want to mm -hmm. do. So if you want to be a roboticist, you really need to uh, follow your passion. Yeah. Well, that's true for most every yeah. job as well. Uh, for robotic roboticists, as I mentioned, you really need to know the fundamental tools mm -hmm. and the language to do mm -hmm. robotics. Mm -hmm. The language for science is math, mm -hmm. and the tools to do robotics is science. Yes. So you need to do really good, uh, good in science and math and those kind of courses. Uh, you need to work hard, but before working hard, mm -hmm. you have to work smart, mm -hmm. then work hard. Okay. A lot of people just work hard. Yeah. They don't know where they're going. They just mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. And then it turns out <laughs> that it's a, uh, a cliff, yeah. and then all time and energy wasted. Yeah. So before you work hard, you need to know which direction mm -hmm. to go. And actually, partially, that's my job to guide them as yeah. a advisor to do that. So. You also emphasize that um, not only should people focus on that work, but they need to see how the work impacts society. Yes. Right? Yep. Can you comment on that? Sure. So it's very, very crucial. So this is actually a, a relatively new thing that I'm in the past five years that I mm -hmm. started to think. We develop technology, but we as a we are responsible to really mm -hmm. think about the impact yep. our work will have on society. Mm -hmm. uh, the blind driver challenge, mm -hmm. the Raphael hand for prosthetic mm -hmm. applications, search and rescue missions, mm -hmm. firefighting roles to save people's lives. All of these are good things. Yep. But the thing is, as roboticist, this Sapphire fighting fire, firefighting robot. Yes. It's going to handle these fire hose and it's going to point at the fire. Mm -hmm. It needs to throw these fire, uh, fire suppressant uh, uh, canisters. Who can stop it having, instead of a fire hose, have a gun mm -hmm. and aim to a person? Or instead of a canister, throw ah. a grenade, right? So there's the potential to use this technology that's for good to harm people. Yes. So, I for mean, military purposes. Military, possible. not necessarily harm, right? So. Uh, so it's my person. I'm not naive. I do understand we do need to have mm -hmm. uh, defense military robots. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of projects in military, mm -hmm. but it's my, just my personal philosophy mm -hmm. that I'm not going to. I, I don't do mil uh, weaponized robots. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my just my personal uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 philosophy. But again, I cannot stop once the technology, the robots leaves our lab. Mm -hmm. It's a firefighting robot. Yeah. I cannot stop of it being used for other purposes. Yeah. I mean, Einstein's uh, you know theory relatively mm -hmm. uh, to, you know led to the the new nuclear uh, you know, bombs. bombs and yes. weapons and those kind of things today. Yeah. So I struggle a lot. But so my conclusion is that um, robots are still tools. Mm -hmm. It's tools for humans beings to mm -hmm. use. So whether it's going to be used for the good or bad, mm -hmm. it's not about the robotics technology, mm -hmm. it's about people, it's about the human. And I truly believe the oh. good nature of human and ethics is important. So I try to teach that at school as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's been such a pleasure to work with you today and uh, do this interview. It's been one of the most fun for me because I personally love technology. Yay. And <laughs> um, and I'd like to uh, end our interview with a little bit of a celebration okay. um, by doing the robot dance. You really want to do I it? I really want to do the robot dance. I'm going to regret this. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been such a pleasure to meet Thanks you. Thanks for having All me. Right, no problem. Yep. And so let's sign off okay. with the robot cool. dance. Mm. C-3PO. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>